Tonight, if you want to pre-order Google's Nexus 6, <laughs> good luck. More details about the MCX current C's hack and the war over mobile payment terminals is heating up. Yes, I'm serious. Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 204, for Wednesday, October 29th, 2014. This episode is brought to you by Squarespace, the all-in-one platform that makes it fast and easy to create your own professional website or online portfolio. For a free two-week trial and 10% off, go to squarespace.com and use the offer code TECHNIGHT. Oh, hello there. I'm Sarah Lane, and let's get right into today's tech feed. Google opened up pre-orders for its Nexus 6 today, the flagship Android 5.0 lollipop phone that starts at $649 for a 32-gigabyte model or 64-gigabyte model for $699. Now, don't get too excited, because if you didn't pre-order yet, you might be waiting a while. Both sizes sold out almost instantly, I think. Jason Howell told me it was like 30 seconds or something. Though additional stock may return, and Google isn't exactly saying how big the inventory was. All four major U.S. carriers will be carrying the Nexus 6, but on contract pricing isn't official yet. Now, it comes in two different colors, midnight blue and cloud white, so you've got some options there, and has a really big 5.9-inch Quad HD display. Not just that, but Google's getting serious about Android TV as well, and its Asus-made Nexus Player became available for pre-order today as well for $99 with expected shipment in early November. It's kind of got the hockey puck look, a Nexus logo on the top. It doesn't really stand out too much, but it's supposed to act like a guide to all the video in Google's Play Store, which includes movies, but also developers can create and modify apps to run on bigger screens through the Nexus player. No HBO Go yet. That's sort of a standard for these cord cutting machines. But there is Netflix and Hulu apps for content. As for other Android TV options, if this one doesn't seem perfect for you, Sony, Sharp, and Philips have all committed to making Android TV powered sets come next year. So you'll have more choices soon enough. MCX, which is the mobile payment technology company started by the consortium of retailers led by Walmart and CVS and Rite Aid and Target and some other chains. We've been talking about them this week as far as the whole Apple Pay nonsense. What this does is allows retailers to sidestep the 2 to 3% fee that they traditionally pay credit card companies. Now that company, MCX, is saying, hey, we're flexible. Don't blame us. In a press conference today, MCX's CEO, Deckers Davison, said, quote, we're agnostic about technology. We started with QR code-based technology that allows us to go to the market broadly. If we need, we can pivot to NFC. In other words, if a store prefers the NFC system used by Apple Pay over MCX's mobile payment app, Currency's QR code system, Currency could switch over. Davison notes that MCX is working with retailers on other technology that goes beyond QR codes already. Now, in response to a claim from the New York Times that it would make retailers pay fees for breaking exclusivity agreements and using other mobile payment methods like Apple Pay, Davison says, quote, it's simply not true. There are no fines. Davison also addressed a hack of its email system that was made public this morning, saying that its email provider was hacked indeed, but that the hack exposed some dummy zip codes and some tester email addresses. Downplayed it, basically. Microsoft cut an additional 3,000 jobs from its workforce around the world this morning, making the 18,000 job cut totals that were announced by CEO Satya Nadella back in July pretty much complete. About 638 of the job cuts were in the Seattle region. That's where Microsoft is headquartered. The company employed more than 42,500 people in the area uh, at the end of September. So, you know, it was a small, small fraction of that total workforce. Now, the overall reduction of those 18,000 positions represents roughly 14% of the 127,000 people employed by the company as of June. And about 12,500 of those were in the newly acquired Nokia smartphone division. Okay, this is an interesting story. See if you can follow me because it was hard enough for me to absorb. Back in 2007, the FBI wrote a fake news story about bomb threats in Thurston County, Washington, and then sent out email links that resembled the Seattle Times, obviously a widely read newspaper in that region, in order to fool a suspect into clicking the link and revealing his whereabouts. Now, the actual Seattle Times editor, Kathy Best, said in response today, quote... 
We are outraged that the FBI, with the apparent assistance of the U.S. Attorney's Office, misappropriated the name of the Seattle Times to secretly install spyware on the computer of a crime suspect. Not only does that cross a line, it erases it. So what happened here? All right. The delay has something to do with this. The information was gathered from documents about the 2007 FBI operation, which were acquired via a Freedom of Information Act request and then published by the Electronic Frontier Foundation, EFF, in 2011. Now, yesterday, Christopher Sogyan, hope I'm saying your name right, Christopher, who's the ACLU technologist, one of them anyway, referenced the Seattle Times reference in a post on Twitter, which then prompted the Times response today. Now, in response to the Times, Frank Montoya Jr., who's a special agent in charge of the FBI in Seattle, told the Times... We identified a specific subject of an investigation and used a technique that we deemed would be effective in preventing a possible act of violence in a school setting. Use of that type of technique happens in very rare circumstances and only when there is sufficient reason to believe it could be successful in resolving a threat. So here's what happened. The FBI emailed the fake news story via link to the suspect's MySpace account using MySpace at the time, this was 2007. When the suspect clicked on the link, FBI software revealed his location and IP address to agents that were working on the case, and a suspect, a juvenile, was arrested in June of that year. Sources tell the Washington Post that hackers believed to be working for the Russian government breached the unclassified White House computer networks in recent weeks, which resulted in temporary disruptions to some services. Now, the intruders apparently did not damage any of the systems, and there isn't evidence that the classified network, the important network, was indeed hacked. The FBI, the Secret Service, and the National Security Agency are all involved in the investigation at this point. White House officials are predictably not commenting on who was behind the intrusion or how much data, if any, was taken. Coming up, would you like some kitten delivery? I can tell you who's doing it. And up next, Ruth Reader from VentureBeat is here to talk about the next war in mobile payments, the card reader terminals. Dun, dun, dun. But first, let's thank Squarespace for sponsoring this episode of Tech News Tonight. Squarespace is the all-in-one platform that makes it really easy to create your own professional website or online portfolio. Isn't that nice? Easy yet professional. That's great. Some of the reasons that you'll love Squarespace are their beautiful designs. Great, great, great templates right out of the gate. 25 of them, in fact, that show you a really wide range of the kind of website that you can put together for yourself with really little to no effort on your part or as much as you want. You really you really have the option to, to customize or not at all. They also uh, recently added a logo creator tool. So if you've ever wanted that perfect logo that represents you and your company and and and, and you just want to start somewhere but you, you don't have those design chops, Squarespace can do all of that for you. The company has live chat and email support 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So you've always got somebody who's willing to help you. And of course, there are e-commerce options for all the subscription plan levels. So you can accept donations, raise money, good for nonprofits, or you might be running a marathon or you're you're raising some money for your upcoming wedding. All sorts of reasons that you might want to do that. That's all, that's all included in the Squarespace uh, templates that you can start with. Plans start at just $8 a month. Includes a free domain name if you sign up for a year. And you probably want to, right? If you put some effort into making a website. It also includes hosting too. So Squarespace does it all. They've got two apps that are very helpful for busy professionals on the go. There's a metric app for iPhone and iPad that allows you to check your site stats and 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 who's coming to your website and, and who's following you. The blog app uh, lets you make text updates on the go, add images, change layouts, pretty much anything you want to do when you're mobile. Again, hosting is included. Squarespace takes care of all of that so you don't have to. When you have a Squarespace site, it's an all-in-one professional website. You can start a free two-week trial with no credit card. Just start building your website. Have fun. Take a couple weeks, see how it works. When you decide to sign up for Squarespace, make sure to use the offer code TECHNIGHT and you'll get 10% off and you also show your support for us. Thanks to Squarespace for their support of TN2. A better web awaits and it starts with your new Squarespace website. Joining us now is VentureBeat's Ruth Reader. Hello, Ruth. Hello. Thanks for joining us. All right, so we've had uh, a lot of conversation this week, particularly about Apple Pay and and currency, and how yeah, the public who is interested in 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 getting rid of not just cash but all of our credit cards are kind of caught in the middle. 
So today you wrote an article about how payment terminals are sort of the next frontier. Tell us a little bit about what's happening over the next year. So in the next year, what you're going to see is that a lot of merchants are going to have to switch over their payment terminals from magnetic stripe credit cards to EMV cards. Mm -hmm. And those are chip cards. And basically what those are is they're a standard that was developed by Europay, MasterCard, and Visa. And it's basically, I mean, it's an actual circuit chip in your card and it's a higher level of authentication. All right. So for anybody who is sort of starting to drown in the details of, well, you've got Apple Pay and that's NFC. You've, you've, you know, it, we, um, we, we spoke uh, to somebody based in Australia who was saying, oh, yeah, we've all got the the little uh, the chips in our in our credit cards now. That that works out pretty well for us. What is the difference between all of these? Really, when it comes down to consumers and 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 how they can pay for things at these large retail chains. So EMV cards are basically just a, a, a new standard of authentication. Um, and that can be, and basically how that works is that you can, sorry, I'm explaining this badly. <laughs> it's um, okay. <laughs> EMV cards basically are similar to credit cards, similar to what you're used to. You know, you can put them in a card dip as opposed to like a sh a swipe through. Mm -hmm. um, but but it's a similar idea. It's You're still using a card. Um, what differentiates that from the traditional card is that you have this new level of authentication. So as opposed to one of the big problems that merchants have had this year is that you've been able to steal credit card data from, um, you've basically been able to have credit card data ripped from things that have been, been put into terminals. And that's how hackers get your information. So the EMV card prevents that by, by making your data encrypted. Um, NFC, which is sort of in order to talk about NFC and in order to talk about Apple Pay, you sort of have to talk about them together. NFC is near field communication. So it's literally just, you know, shortwave communication technology. Um, Apple Pay uses that to transfer, to transfer your payment data from the phone to the payment terminal. Now, as far as payment terminals, there are a variety of companies that people might be familiar with, even if they haven't uh, used them directly. Uh, um, you know, taxi drivers were using the square dongles for a while uh, and, and and still are in some cases. Etsy has its own. Uh, there are, you know, PayPal uh, has gotten into the in the terminal space. Tell us about Point, uh, P-O-Y-N-T, which was a new company started by uh, somebody that actually came from Google Wallet. Yes, so former head of Google Wallets, Osama Bedier, uh, founded Point basically right after he left Google a year and a half ago. Uh, and he decided that once he rolled out NFC technology for Google Wallet, he was ready to sort of tackle the other side of the beast. Uh, and that is the payment terminal. And it's a funny space because you have people who have been there for a very, very long time, right? You've got Verifone, which you probably don't know, but you know, if you've ever seen a very clunky, plastic, ugly card reader anywhere, that's probably belongs to Verifone. Yeah, I've and seen them at my, my local grocery store for a few years now. At least I, I, I know the brand, rec I've got the brand recognition. Right. So they've been around forever. Um, and then you've got newer guys like Square, and they're sort of trying to disrupt the whole payment space uh, with, you know, their little card readers. Um, that are cheap and easy to produce. And, and that was a really interesting movement. So now what we're seeing from Point is sort of a, a, like a hybrid of those two things. If you look at it, you can see that there are, there's that screen in front and that's sort of the consumer interface, right? And on the back end um, is, the, is the merchant interface. So you've got two touch screens, sort of like two tablets, one like tiny cell phone size tablet and, or screen and the other like an actual tablet size, about seven inches, I believe. Um, and what Point really wants is for you, exactly as this video shows, to sort of do away ultimately with the register and do all of your payments in its little, like, you know, easel-shaped uh, payment device. Now, so, so many of these, you know, they, they, they look sleek. They, they definitely look futuristic. It, it seems like, sure, as a consumer, if it's convenient as possible, that's great. On the merchant side, though, I mean, it, who, who wins this uh, this this payment terminal race? I mean, is it just whatever company can give the merchant the best rate? Because obviously that's how they're making money. I mean, not all of these companies are probably going to survive. 
Well, it's a tricky question because on the one hand, there is a lot of opportunity here because because it has been dominated by two big companies for a very long time. Um, Verifone is one of them and then Ingenico is the other, but though they tend to have a bigger share of the market worldwide than Verifone does. So there is a lot of opportunity. I don't know that it will necessarily come down to rates per se, because a lot of these things, like let's look at Point, for example, they're not charging merchants for anything more than the terminal. They charge merchants a flat fee of 300 bucks Mm. and the banks take that. And where Point makes its money is through its platform. Um, So quite like Square, it has a platform, it has a commerce platform, it has an app platform. So they can download anything like scheduling apps or appointment apps or analytics or any of those sort of like back office applications that, you know, QuickBook does or, you know, or Square does. Square is increasingly moving into that space. So I think a lot of these companies are looking at it in terms of value added. What can they do to make the merchant's life simpler? How can they be their one point of contact? And the way that Point is doing it that is interesting is that it integrates with all of those things. So let's say you have an existing register, right? You can use Point as just a payment terminal. That's all it has to be. It And it accepts everything. It accepts NFC, EMV, whatever. Um, now, you may eventually, you're, or rather your point of sale might eventually die, as they do. You know, these devices don't last forever. And at that point, you could just keep going with Point's point of sale. So it really, what it will really depend on, I think, all in all, is... Who can provide the most value? Yeah, exactly. It, what, it, in, in one year from today, I, I always ask people, what is it going to look like in one year from today? I think, especially with the payment terminals, very differently, of course, because uh, these companies really do have to upgrade their systems in many cases. Ruth Reader writes for VentureBeat. Thanks so much for joining us, Ruth. And before we let you go, uh, remind folks where they can keep up with your work. Oh, uh, you can find me at VentureBeat.com. You can also find me on Twitter at Ruth Reader. Excellent. Thanks so much for inviting me. Well, thanks for being here. All right. I mentioned kitties and I don't know if you realize that today is National Cat Day. Yes, I've been celebrating all day. So ride a service Uber, which Uber's, you know, I don't know if you would think of Uber as the goodwill company necessarily, but they would like to be. They're offering a one day only special that charges uh, customers $30 to have a kitten delivered to them for 15 minutes of kitten cuddling. Now, the company has teamed up with uh, the Cheeseburger Network and also the ASPCA, which is the American SPCA, for uh, the second year in a row, actually. If this sounds familiar, they actually did do this last year to bring kitten delivery to Austin, Chicago, Washington, D.C., New York, Phoenix, San Francisco, and Seattle. Apologies, if you're not in any of those cities, but if you're allergic, maybe this is all for the best. Every dollar from the visit is donated directly to the participating shelters in each city. And in most cities, customers also have the option of adopting the kittens that they cuddle for those 15 minutes. Be careful, by the way. There's, you know, only so much time left in the day, but even cuddling a kitten for like a minute, you'll probably adopt it. Thanks, Uber. And that's it for this edition of Tech News Tonight. You can subscribe to the show at twit.tv slash TN2. Please do that if you enjoy the show. Uh, help support us. You can write us with feedback at TN2 at twit.tv. And don't you dare miss Tech News Today. That is our morning newscast tomorrow and every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. I'm Sarah Lane. I'll see you tomorrow. Thanks for watching. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by cashfly.com.